Good morning, District 7. Now, back in the 80s, it was Save the Whales. Today, it's Save the Bandwidth. Yes, so I only get a look at your name. So, bummer! No interaction. But then again, this is Zoom session. Good morning. It's time to kick off TLI in a grand fashion. Yes, this morning, you are in competitive crochet. Uh, wait, no, anatomy of feedback. That is correct. I have the right presentation. So many years ago, when I joined Toastmasters, I thought I had evaluation all figured out. I was critical. I was harsh. I pointed out exactly what they did wrong. And then I got to my first area contest and I did the exact same thing. I thought I did marvelous. I sat down to have my mentor lean forward and tap me on the shoulder from behind and say, what were you doing? That doesn't work out here. As soon as the next evaluator got up and gave their evaluation, I immediately understood what he was saying. Because in my club, we gave harsh, critical, negative, terrible evaluations to the speakers because we believed it was our job to keep the speaker away from the next project unless they had mastered this project to our standards. Yeah, we had trouble keeping members. That club is no longer in existence. Big surprise. So this morning, you are here for a presentation I have titled Anatomy of Feedback. This presentation has gone various places, including around the world. And here we are, Anatomy of Feedback with me and District 7. Yes, I have to remember where I am. Good morning. The feedback that we are going to be talking about is anytime you are talking to anybody who is giving a speech or giving a presentation or giving anything. But specifically, I am tailoring this to directly inside of Toastmasters meetings. So today, if we get into the right screen, there, this is what we're talking about. We're going to be talking about the anatomy, the skeleton, the senses, the soul, and the brain of a speech, because in order to be a good evaluator, you need to know the structure of a speech. Then we're going to be talking about the delivery of the feedback. That is going to be the most important section. And I'm going to say that many times because I love the phrase most important. I have many different phrases that I use. And there is anatomy of feedback bingo for my favorite phrases. Anybody gets five in a row, you get a prize. Okay, our first topic. And actually, now that I mention it, questions. If you have questions as I go through the presentation, please post your questions in the text. And then at the near the end, we will, I will stop talking and open it up and we will answer some of those questions. Get those out there. Ruth will be watching those and we will answer. Any additional questions that you have, I can take by email later. We'll get to those. Okay, topic number one, the skeleton. The skeleton is essentially the basic superstructure of a speech. It, I believe that it is necessary for any evaluator, in fact, any speaker, to understand the four basic types of speeches. There are only four different types of speeches in the world, the absolute world. You're never going to find any more than this. Well, maybe. But those four types, informing, persuading, Instructing and entertaining presentations can fall into one of those four categories extremely easily. As a speaker, it makes sense to know exactly how you're constructing your speech. As an evaluator, this is where I start first. Look at the structure of the speech and decide, okay, is the speaker entertaining me? Are they trying to persuade me? Is it instructional? Is it merely informational? And therein lies the first piece of evaluation, because if they're talking about getting out there and getting the vote and doing et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but they never have a call to action, they never tell me what to do, I'm going to say, okay, that seemed a little more informational as opposed to persuasive. So once you have identified the structure, the basic skeleton of the speech, where do we step next? Well, next... We step into the senses. So the senses are, as you can imagine, what you can see, what you feel, hopefully not what you're tasting. Hmm. 
well, I don't know, it used to be that we could taste things, especially if it was demonstrational type speech. But right now on Zoom, I'm not sure you want to taste your microphone. You have those different aspects of the senses of a speech. These are the three that I am specifically talking about. Vocal quality, what you are hearing, your visuals, and the gestures and the movement, what you are seeing. So we are focusing on two of the primary senses because in the online format that is primarily, there's, there's another bingo word, primarily, that is primarily the two aspects that you are going to be dealing with the most. It is what you see and what you hear. Vocal quality is useful, especially if you cannot be heard and understood. Well, if you're on mute, obviously that is a big issue because you're not going to be heard giving your presentation. But there's more to it than simple vocal quality. For that matter, where the position of the microphone is in relation to your mouth will make a whole lot of difference. Because now my microphone is clear over there and you're probably not hearing me as well as you were before. This is one of the primary reasons that I say, do not stand up and move away from your microphone. The closer the microphone is to your mouth, the better sound quality you are going to get and the less shouting you will have to do in your own room. I've learned that quite, um, quite recently, I have to stop shouting because my cat hates it. As soon as I start yelling at my computer, she exits the room immediately and probably everybody nearby. Sound quality is crucial, especially in the online format. If your message is not being heard, if it is not clear, if it is not coming across as you want it to, you are losing out a very large portion of presentation. Now, why do I say this as a speaker? Well, because this is a very valid topic for an evaluator. We've been on online meeting formats for quite a while now. And I'm still encountering evaluators that insist on evaluating as if we were in person, talking about body movement and stage presence and not talking directly to the technology that we need to use for this format. I think that is not doing a speaker a good service because the presentation is online. The evaluation should reflect that. Vocal quality specifically speak to the quality of their vocals. Is there ex any extraneous sounds in the room, thumping, shuffling of papers or keyboard noises? In person, this would be the hand in the pocket, playing with the change or the keys, especially for guys, they love to do that, or the clicking of a pen. It's whatever sound is distracting or how can the sound be even better? Well, for that matter, let's talk about visuals and eye contact. That is linked immediately with gestures, because this is your frame. This is all you have on the screen. I don't think it's valuable to move away from that to get a larger perspective, because as soon as I move away, I am getting smaller on your screen. And some people are watching this on their phone. That is not very much real estate to take up. Now, I'm a big guy, but on the phone, I actually look like I weigh much less. Now, that might be a good thing. Anyway, my feeling is you want to take up as much of the real estate that you have available as comfortable. Now, that doesn't mean that you're like right up in the camera. Nice distance away so you have a good head and shoulder shot. With that in mind, be aware that any gestures you use need to be within this frame. Now, as an evaluator, it's very valid when you have a speaker and they're gesturing, you can see them moving off the screen. The gestures are meant to enhance a presentation. If gestures are happening somewhere where you can't see them, they're not necessarily enhancing. So I would point out to the speakers that the gestures couldn't be seen, that their three points were in fact off the screen somewhere. Now, a pro tip for those of you who are speakers and wondering how to keep your gestures on screen, well, I simply leave the little itty bitty window of myself in the upper right because I can't see any of you anyway because we're all on, got our, you know, our cameras are turned off. So I leave that just in my peripheral vision. I can see where my hands are so I know exactly what gestures are showing up in the screen and which ones are off the screen. So I have my presentation over here. I've got my little picture up there. 
this is how I'm monitoring and making sure that what you are seeing is what I want to present you. Now, as with Zoom and as with vocal and visuals, lighting is crucial. Primary lighting directly in front can be pretty harsh. I've got a primary light directly to my right, a secondary light over here to the left, and then an upper light as well. You wanna make sure you are pretty well lit. You don't want harsh backgrounds or harsh shadows, and you don't want a, a too strong backlight that's gonna completely wash you out because you are the presenter. You are presenting your material. I want to see you more than I want to see the curtains in front of the window that you're in front of. That being said, I understand that there are restrictions on where we have and what we can do with what we have. I encourage you to look around whatever situation you're in to try and find the best, most optimal, non-expensive lighting and sound solution that you have. You don't need to go to the top of the range unless you are doing presentations on a regular basis. For that matter, this is my setup right now. This is what you're not seeing on the other side of the camera, a very messy desk, the microphone, the laptop, and all the other bits and pieces. Well, that's the other nice thing about the online meetings is you can't see the mess because I've got a screen behind me. This is also valid for an evaluator. What you are seeing, what you are hearing, and what is being presented, absolutely crucial. I was recently asked to evaluate somebody's contest speech. They sent me a video and I watched that video to provide them with some positive responses. Well, the first thing they did was they started the video, then they stood up and moved about five feet back. They became very small. Their microphone was five feet in front of them and the lighting was not so great. So I didn't even talk about the content of their speech because everything in the room was lending itself to me dismissing exactly what they were saying or me not being able to hear or see anything. As an evaluator, your primary job, as I see it, is to help the speaker make the speech that they are giving into an even better presentation. Uh, I say that again. You are not trying to be critical. You are trying to help them make it better. Because they've gotten it, they've gotten the speech to this point without any of your help. And they're doing a really good job of it. So, how can you make the presentation even better? Let's point out some ideas that they haven't seen that help them take it to the next level. This is our next topic: the soul. The soul. As you might imagine, the soul of a speech, or for that matter, the soul of an evaluation, is the energy. The humor, the pathos, even the authenticity, and especially, I'm going to go right to number three first, because online meetings, it's really difficult to have that natural sense of authenticity, because I'm not talking to you. I'm staring at that little webcam in front of me with the glaring red eye that I have nicknamed the Terminator, and it doesn't blink, it doesn't smile, it doesn't give me any type of reaction. So it can be really, really easy for me to suddenly just go flat and sound like I'm talking to the walls. To be able to have that sense of interconnectedness and authenticity, how that is going to help when you're evaluating a speech, is the speaker actually looking into the camera or is the speaker spending time reading their notes off the side of the camera? Yes, that can be a hard one, especially when you have notes that you are using for your presentation. Well, my answer to that is to place the notes directly beside the camera on top of the screen, because I'm not looking at the screen anyway. And then I'm able to read them off to the side and just look to the side real easily, as opposed to looking down or having to look at my keyboard for them. And that's something that's, that's how you can help somebody with an evaluation. So their authenticity. It's how connected you feel to them. That includes the vocals. That includes the eyes. That includes just them being real with you. And for that matter, reality, you got to have energy, humor, and pathos. Video, 
anytime you are an online platform, you're doing videos for YouTube, you're doing TikTok, you're doing any of those things. Video quashes energy like you wouldn't believe. You think you are dynamic and interesting and somebody takes a video of you and you come across as flat as an inchworm. That's because the technology tamps down on all of that. What you need to do as a presenter and what you can tell to speakers is that when you come to video, come to online sessions, you have to take your energy up to a much higher level because that energy has to come from within you. You're not picking it up from the audience because the audience is not with you. As, as an actor, because that's what I studied in college, we would draw energy from the audiences. Each individual performance would have a different energy level depending upon the energy from the audience. Well, you can't do that in an online format because the energy field that you're picking up is exactly the same every single time. So speakers have to imbue their speeches with a level of energy that comes from within them, which means large cups of coffee for me before the presentation. Humor and pathos is also a huge piece Humor, everybody loves kind of, a, you know, the humorous approach, the enjoyable approach to a speech because we're trapped in our rooms. It's a Saturday morning and, you know, outside my window, it's actually sunny right now. Oh, my goodness. Well, if I wasn't being humorous, anyway, thank you for being here, by the way. The humor and the pathos is important because you want people to enjoy the presentation. Now, how do you inject humor and pathos into an evaluation? We'll talk about that a little bit later in the delivery, but this is talking about the humor of the pathos inside of the presentation. Were there points where the speaker could inject some humor because they just hit a really intense emotional spot and you need a break? I received this feedback just last, last month for that matter. I was working on a speech and everybody was in, impressively in touch, emotionally touched by the content of the speech. The evaluator told me at the end, they said, you know, it might be really good to inject a little piece of humor just to break that tension so that people can have a bit of a release because you're taking them into a very intense subject. And I agreed with him. I think that's a great idea. As soon as you take somebody into the intensity, you want to be able to bring them back out again. So that's where humor, pathos, all those other pieces we have somebody that's unmuted. Could you please mute your microphone? I'm getting some background noise. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our next topic, the brain. The brain, the big brain of the speech, the brain of the evaluation. What is the brain, you ask? It's a good thing you asked because I want an answer if you didn't ask. The brain, the ideas, the content, the research, and the data. This is the material behind the presentation. Most of the time, when you're talking about yourself, all of that is coming from your brain, your memories, your all the other bits and pieces. But when you're doing that, that third project from uh, the first level of any path, research and presenting, you want to research something, find some good data, present it in there. This is, a, this is a really good location for an evaluator to point out that maybe we could have had a little bit more information, especially if it was a research presentation. Where did the facts come from? Where did the figures come from? Where did you pull those from? Not only is it, it it's not really fact checking as much as it is for me, if a presenter is presenting something that I want to follow up on, I want to know where to find that material. There is, um, well, it's not really unspoken because somebody told me and it's not really unwritten, but there has been a rule within Toastmasters that says you never evaluate a speaker's content. I say hogwash, hogwash, I say hogwash. There are times when you definitely do want to evaluate somebody's content. And I say that those three times when it is perfectly fine to evaluate content, confusion, contradiction, ineffective messaging. Contradiction, basic and primary. When somebody is coming out and giving a speech on the importance of philanthropy and giving back money to their community and being a philanthropist, and they say, and the best way to do this is to take everything you earn and shove it under your mattress and never give it to anybody. Well, okay, uh, maybe they're doing a parody, but if they're really, really, really trying to talk about philanthropy, the definition of philanthropy and putting your money under your mattress are kind of opposed to each other. 
So if I was listening to a speech like that, I would simply point out to the speaker, it seemed like you were talking about one thing, but gave the definition for something else. You might want to research what that term actually means. Then if there is any type of confusion, this as a pro tip, oh my goodness, how many times have you been asked to evaluate a speaker that is really good and you have nothing to give them? This is usually where I go when I, when I hit a really good speaker. I listen intently to the subject, to the presentation they're giving, and to ask myself, what is it exactly are they asking me? What is the message I am giving or I am receiving? To give this back to a polished speaker is gold because a polished speaker is trying to get a very specific message across. And if that message isn't coming across, then there is confusion. There is a place for them to polish the material. And you as a listener, if you are confused about what the speaker is asking you to do or the material that is being presented, I believe that is incredibly valuable time to evaluate their content. Now, the third point, the ineffective messaging. Hmm. Well, I'm going to use a recent example. Recently, I was also asked to review somebody's content uh, evaluation contest speech that they gave. And they were talking about, hmm, well, how do we put this? Okay, it was Nick Hill's speech that he won the district contest last year, 2020. Fantastic speech, won first place and was going to take it to the regionals. He asked me to review the the video that he had for it. I watched the video and it kind of, uh, it just, there was part of it that didn't seem right for that time. His primary concept was to die empty, to rid yourself of all of your best ideas before you get to the graveyard. Great metaphor, absolutely wonderful metaphor. But if you put that metaphor right up against the reality of a pandemic where people were worried about dying alone, and not being a, be able to be around their loved ones, it felt like it was a really good example of ineffective messaging, or for that matter, bad timing. Because if he'd given that speech months before, it would have been perfect. It would have been a metaphor. It wouldn't have crossed over into actual practical regality. And those are, they're kind of fine tidbits, but those are three areas where I believe it is, it is valid to talk to a speaker's content. But there are times when you don't want to do that. Believe me, there are times when you do not want to do that. I say those three times when you stay away from evaluating content from personal experience is when you are offended, when you are angered, or any time you feel you are right and the presenter is wrong. Now, how do I know these things? Because, ah, because I've done all of them. I did. We had a wonderful presentation by a club member and I was her evaluator and I got up and I just launched into a screed. Yes, I am very ashamed of what I said because I talked directly to the content, disagreed with her. I don't think I called her any names, but it was a bad evaluation and several people afterwards pointed out exactly what I had done and how it could have been better. So yes, do not evaluate content, angered, offended, or anytime you feel like you're right, because what is going to be said is not going to be in a positive format. And I am, I am behooving you, asking you, beseeching you to keep your evaluations positive and helping the speaker present better. So these are the four topics we have covered in the first section skeleton, soul, senses, brain of a speech. And this is where we get a transition to what I call the bedside manner. Yeah, I know I had to go with the, the anatomy kind of feedback. So I figured I'd pick on doctors too. I mean, come on. There are some doctors out there with terrible bedside manners. They deliver their information without even looking at the patient, walk out the door. Oh my goodness. Anyway, don't be a bad doctor. Uh, don't be a bad evaluator either for that matter. Delivery of the feedback, the bedside manner. There are three important things to keep in mind. I love threes. You know, it's the power of threes. You're going to see a lot of threes today. Bedside manner, what the speaker wants, what the audience hears, and how to inspire both. Why do I include the audience? I'll talk about that. But the reality being that you are not only giving an evaluation to the speaker, you're giving an evaluation to everybody else in the room. 
So what the speaker wants from an evaluation? This is one of the first questions that I ask myself. Primarily, the speaker wants to be heard. Why else would they be doing this? They want to be heard. They want to be heard. Their message. If they have spent the time creating a speech, a powerful speech, a funny speech, an instructional speech, if they don't get the opportunity to be heard, if they don't get the validation of being heard, that, I believe, is, a, mm, is not a good way to go. For an evaluator, how do you let the speaker know you heard them? Well, you speak directly to them. You talk about their speech. Uh, there are many evaluators that will get up and start talking about how they had a similar experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I, I can get that. But I believe that the primary purpose an evaluator is up there is to let the speaker know that they were heard. How do you do this? Specifically, there are techniques for doing this. You make your evaluation empathetic, targeted, and future-focused. Empathetic. Don't be a jerk. Don't be like me who was lambasting people and being hypercritical. Don't be the jerk. Be empathetic. Because if this is the first time that somebody is giving a speech to the club, if this is their icebreaker, this is the first time that they're in there, they have been so afraid of getting up in front of people and presenting or so afraid of presenting in front of people on this computer thing with the unblinking staring eye of the Terminator. Let them know you heard them. And for that matter, if you have the opportunity, and I hope you do, before the speech, ask them what they want evaluated. That is a really good way to let them know that you heard them, is to ask them, okay, what would you like me to evaluate in this speech? And if John says, you know, I'm really having trouble with my eye contact because I can't manage staring at this camera the whole time, could you talk about that? Then incorporate that into your evaluation. If you ask them what they want to know and then don't provide it to them, you're doing them a disservice. So offer them that information, a targeted feedback. And that's what I mean by target is by asking them what they want out of the evaluation and make sure to use that, that positive language. Now, future focused, this is a term that I pulled from a recent study that I found and the title of the study is no longer on my screen. Let's see if I can find it over here. Here it is. The Future of Feedback, Motivating Performance Improvement Through Future-Focused Feedback. And the study that was done primarily focused on evaluations in the workplace. It talked about how a supervisor providing an evaluation of an employee's past activities isn't nearly as effective as a supervisor providing the employee some ideas about how to change in the future. And it works perfectly for speeches. If you think about it, you've got somebody who gives a presentation, they're not prepared, they're reading entirely from their piece of paper, they're bumbling. It's kind of clear to you that they didn't have time to rehearse their presentation. Well, as an evaluator, we would be tempted to say, yeah, it I don't think you had a whole lot of time to prepare for that. It would have been better if you'd spent you know, more time doing that before you'd given your speech. That is natural. What I'm saying is change it. Change it to future focused. Instead of saying what they didn't do in the past, tell them what they can do in the future. In other words, the next time you give the presentation, I would suggest just carving out about five minutes a day for three days before you give your presentation so that you are much more comfortable with the material before you present it again. And the reason why you do this, because as soon as an evaluator tells me that I didn't have enough time to present and I should have prepared more and I should have done all of these things, the things that are going through my head is, dude, you do not even know the week that I had. I had to take the cat to the vet, my, et cetera. You know, the pipes broke, the this broke, because in the past, it's concrete. Whatever happened, happened in that exact way. But in the future, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I could schedule setting aside five more minutes to do this or, or to do that. And it works also for technology, future-focused. What you may consider, you tell them as your evaluator, 
as an evaluator, what you might consider, because that camera, you don't like staring at it, is put a little heart symbol next to your camera. So it's a little bit nicer to look at, or maybe make a smiley face and have the camera be one of the eyes. That's something you could do in the future so that you feel more comfortable looking at your camera. If you make your evaluation future focused in positive terms, you are going to, as my grandmother always said, you are going to catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Now, a couple things come up with that. I have no idea why she was trying to catch flies, but I understand the metaphor. Honey is a much sweeter medium, and I would be more likely to respond to coffee cake than a plate of asparagus. See, there's my metaphor. Coffee cake versus asparagus. Oh, I hate asparagus. So, Next up, what the audience hears. Well, you have to remember that the room has ears. When you're doing an evaluation, you are not just speaking to the speaker. You are talking to everybody else in the room. Case in point, I had a speaker when I went and asked them, I said, what kind of an evaluation would you like? And they said, oh, I, I, you know, I want a good structural evaluation. I want to know what's working and what's not working in the speech and how to make it better and just focus on all the improvements of what I could do. I said, okay, I can do that. So I got up in front of everybody and I focused on every single way that the speech could be shifted, could be changed, could be improved and what didn't work and how it could be shifted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I spoke directly to that person. Well, that was an okay evaluation in one sense. It gave the speaker everything they wanted to know. But what I didn't know for two weeks after was that there were two visitors in the room and they never came back to the club when our vice president of membership reached out to them, asking them if they'd like to come back. They both said essentially, yeah, we, we couldn't handle that type of evaluation. Uh, no way no way, no how, we're not at that level, sorry, your club's not for us. Okay, that's a compliment in one way, but a problem, a bigger problem in another. It's a compliment that it's a good evaluation, but the problem was our club wasn't attracting new members. And to keep a club vital, you kind of need the new members. So please remember when you do your evaluations, everybody else in the room is going to hear you. And how do you do that? Well, inside of your evaluation, make it informative, explanative, and inclusive. Now, informative, what do I mean? Okay, simple enough. Talk about the project that the speaker was doing. Usually, between the time that the Toastmaster announces what they're going to be speaking about and the time the evaluator comes up, I've forgotten what that project is. So if you come up and you say, Elizabeth was working on the fourth project from the third level of engaging humor. She was working on the storytelling. Okay, great. That informs me. That brings me back to the knowledge that you have and she has about her speech so that everybody's on the same page. Explanative. What I mean about explanative. The speakers have techniques that they use that are really good. There are, there are some some very nice rhetorical qualities that I have heard some people use. One of those specifically is alliteration, starting words with the same, same letter. They had a fancy, fun, freakishly furry friend. There, I got five in. If you notice something that a speaker uses and does really well in the speech, by all means, point it out, especially if you know the structure behind it. And structure, well, for that matter, I used to be a member of Story Masters. We focused a lot on the curve of the story arc and how to improve storytelling speeches. A piece of advice that we gave to most speakers was start late, end early. Now, that doesn't mean actual time late, ending early. No, that is a narrative device. You start late into the story. You get right to the action of the story, and then you end that story with a bit of a cliffhanger so your audience wants to hear more. If your speaker does that, point it out as a really good technique. I listened to a presentation where this guy in Thailand was talking about his morning commute was disrupted by a 25-foot python in the highway. Now, he started with, well, I had my morning coffee, then I went to my car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until he got to the python bit that I'm like, oh, my God, that's 
that's where you need to start. Start with a snake in the road. And he's like, oh, yeah, I could do that because the coffee and the car and all the rest of that doesn't matter. So if you have, a, if you get a story from a speaker and you find that point, this is where they need to start. Point it out to them. Suggest that they start late and end early. That's what I mean about being explanative. Because if you explain what you're saying to the audience, they're going to say, oh, start late and early that makes sense in fact it's time to leave no that anyway then be inclusive include everybody in your evaluation how do you do that well hmm on the online meeting format oftentimes what i'll do when i'm doing an evaluation and we have most everybody is on screen and i can see pictures if we're in a small group i'll ask them questions especially if it was a humorous speech because humor is really hard to do here if it was a humorous speech say okay everybody if you found the speech funny, please raise your hand. And then I can do a quick view of how many people are responding and then provide that information back to the speaker. It gets everybody in the room involved. Yeah, you know, throw out questions to them. So what did you think about that? You know, raise your hand if you found yourself kind of tearing up at that story about the dog, the well, and Timmy. Yeah, I know. I, I was too, really. I'd never heard it before. That's a really good way to get information from the audience. It's also a really good way to get additional information into your evaluation for the speaker that you don't have. Because sometimes I find things funny that other people don't. So if I verify with everybody that they found it funny too, then yeah, okay, we're good. So now to inspire both, not only the speaker, but inspire the audience, make it universal, fun, and positive. Now I've mentioned positive multiple times before, universal. Universal, hmm, how do, I, how do I explain universal? Don't be so hyper-focused on an individual point that you exclude the universality of the event. Oh, that is a terrible way of describing it. If you are inclusive, if you draw in not only the people listening to the speech, but the person presenting the speech and yourself, you're making this more of a universal inclusive engagement. You are there in the moment with everybody. You are involved. You are all together in one universe. You're making it fun. This is where you look for the opportunities to inject the humor. Oftentimes, right at the beginning of a presentation is the best place to put in some self-deprecating comment. Now, you don't necessarily know if it will work or not, especially on Zoom, but humor is always the best medicine. There's something about a spoonful of sugar and a plate of asparagus. No, I don't know. There's mixed metaphors there. So if you make it positive, fun, and universal, not only is the speaker going to be appreciative of the evaluation you give them, but the other people in the room will appreciate what you are offering as well. These are the topics we've covered in our bedside manner. Remember, the speaker wants to be heard. They wouldn't be here if they didn't want to be heard. The audience also hears you, so be careful what you say. And inspire both with positivity. One of the uh, primary things that I like to say to most of the speakers that I'm evaluating is, this was great. Do you want me to help you to take it to the next level? Do you want me to help you improve this speech? And if they say no, well, then I guess my job is done. But most of the time they're going to say, well, yeah, yeah, I, I, want, I want some help to make this even better because it was a good presentation. How do you make it even better? All right. So we've gotten to the end and I look for quotes online. I couldn't find one. So I used one that I used a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Effective evaluation is key to improve every area of your life. Yes, I said that several weeks ago. And I'm just continually using the slide. There, by the way, is also my email. That's a great way to reach out to me if you have some questions or we can start a chat or for that matter, if you got a winning lottery ticket, you can send it to me. <clears throat> anyway. Okay, we are now at the question and answer session if you dare. Woo! -hoo! You survived to this point. You can all wake up now. If you if you went back to sleep, you know, take another slug of coffee and Wake up. Okay, so I think it's Ruth. You are on. If you saw some questions in the chat box, fire away. You betcha. Thank you, James. That was wonderful to listen to you this morning. 
Okay, yes, I do have some questions that the audience uh, has posted. So we're going to start from the beginning. Uh, what's the difference between inform and instruct? Someone had said close to the- Okay, the easiest way to think about it instructional is a to-do, how to do, how to bake cookies, how to make a YouTube video, how to write a book, how to write a novel, how to sing a song. That is an instructional. And informational is what is COVID? What is the presidency? What is this tree outside my window? It's informational is presenting information. Instructional is talking about how to do something. Good question. Great. And would you be willing to share with us the name of the microphone you're using? Ah, the name of the microphone. This is Joe. No, just kidding. Uh, it is an MXL770. Okay. It is a, um, yeah, that, that's, that's actually the, the number of it. If you Google it or put it on Amazon, that's what you will find. It's also on an independent shock mount that is attached to a surface that is not on the desk. You're not hearing the booms. Okay, so we'll give this. See, it's right there attached to the side table. And it has its own in and out box right there. So I can adjust the income and the outgo as well as if I have a secondary line coming in. Now, I did not primarily get this for Toastmasters. I got it for doing videos and other things, but it also happens to work for online. Okay, thanks. In terms of the position in the camera or the closest to the camera, what about standing when you're speaking? Standing is a great thing as long as you're not, um, you know, staring down at your camera. If you, you make sure whatever you do, your camera is as close to eye level as possible so that it's natural for you to stare right into it. I have been in meetings where, where people have been standing, like a standing desks. That works really well. Standing or sitting doesn't matter as much as, oh, let me put it in there. Standing is helpful because often when you stand, you have more energy in your presentation. Now, I know that I need to inject more energy so I can sit on my puffy derriere and still put in a lot of energy. If you find that by standing, you have more energy and a better presence in your speech, by all means do that. Just remember to have that camera at eye level. Okay. And Elizabeth asked, how do you put a screen behind you to eliminate distractions in the room? Distractions? Um, well, I'm simply just using a folding screen. So I'm not virtual. I just have this folding screen that I picked up. Uh, I don't know where, Ujimaya, I believe. And it just blocks off the rest of the room. I like it more than the virtual backgrounds because the virtual backgrounds cut off the sides of my hats and I like wearing hats. There are some virtual backgrounds. The green screens work really well, but you got to have a green screen or a green sheet. Experiment with it if you are going to use it, but definitely I would say use something to make the background a little bit less interesting than you are because you want them focusing on you and not the books on your shelves. Okay, wonderful, thanks. And last one is if a speech is offensive, Shouldn't you point that out because the speaker may not be aware of it? That is a, that is a touchy one. Uh, it depends because hmm, even just in my own family, there are things that my family members say that I find offensive, but they don't. So it could very well be that you are the only person that finds the subject offensive. If that is in fact the case, I still say don't, don't, evaluate on that. That would be a really good side conversation to have. And this is one thing that I did not say during the presentation is that if I get a speaker who wants a very critical or a very intense evaluation, I can do that, but I'm going to wait until I talk to them one-on-one -on -one to provide that material. An offensive speech in front of a group, hmm, it's going to have to depend on the subject, the group, um, the situation. It really is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, James. Actually, there's a couple more questions that are popping up here. Are you using headphones or an open speaker? I, I am using uh, ear, earbuds that oh. I put in. Okay. I like wired earbuds. Okay, so the wire goes down through my shirt so you can't see it. comes out the shirt tail and into the computer. I don't like having the speaker with the sound because then that interferes with a microphone because I'm picking up room sounds. I like having wired as opposed to wireless because I found on a lot of the wireless earbuds when I put them in, I was getting signal delay. 
by actually being completely wired, I'm getting uh, high continuity and high acuity and, you know, I'm, I'm not losing anything. There's no delay in the sound. Okay. Okay. And someone asked, how do you time, uh, how do you time or manage documents over sharing screen to present a more fluid presentation? Okay. Can you ask that again? Um, how do you time your documents or manage your documents over sharing screen to pre pre to present a more fluid presentation. Yeah, that's a good one. The number one best way to do it is to give the presentation multiple times because this presentation I have given now probably six or seven times, twice in Thailand, twice in the United Kingdom, um, parts of it at Feedbackers before this. And every single time that I've done the presentation, it's been different. And my interaction with the presentation is either getting better or worse. I'm not quite sure which, but by doing it multiple times, that helps. Now remember, Toastmasters is where we take material to get evaluations to make it even better. I have to keep rem reminding myself of this, that it doesn't have to be perfect the first time I present it because I am presenting it to get feedback to help me make it better. So every time you do a presentation, especially if it's in Toastmasters, get the evaluation and then move forward. And by the way, if you want really intense evaluations, come to Feedbackers because every speaker gets four evaluators. That's, a, that's right, four evaluators. Wow, okay, that's great. Okay, someone was asking a question about um, using more facial expression. So we talk about um, a lot about eye contact, but how about, you know, how do you help a speaker with a very flat face develop more facial expressions? Oh boy. Uh, energy level is going to be a big one because, eh, let's see here. I, the old phrase, go big or go home in theater. It's an exaggeration. Anytime you exaggerate, you got to remember to exaggerate everything. So if your energy is big, hopefully your, eh, how do we put this? Having more energy doesn't mean you are louder. Having more energy means that you are quote unquote bigger. You take up more, your, your demeanor, everything about you is a bit more exaggerated. So that would include the gestures, include the facial features. So uh, the possibilities there could be if they're sitting down, try standing up with a camera at eye level, try doing a few jumping jacks beforehand to get the blood flowing, do some breathing. Uh, I don't suggest, you know, um, really stay away from dairy products because they, they follow your vocal cords. That's just an acting tip. So, yeah, try those. Okay. And we have a bit more time, so I'll take another one here. Um, how can you position the camera so you can still look at your notes and be looking at the camera? Crucial. What I do, like I said earlier, and I kind of touched on it, if I've got notes that I'm going to be referencing during this, the camera I have is right at the top of my, uh, well, my laptop. It's sitting on the top right there. It's clipped to it. So what I do is I print my notes out on like a 50 pound bond paper, something that's nice and thick. And then I will set those on either side of the camera. So you can't see them, but they are essentially like this right on either side of the camera. I'm completely covering my monitor, but I can see my notes to either side very clearly. And I cover my monitor because I really don't need to see anything here for that part of the presentation. If I have notes on both sides and I've got a timer that's giving me time, I'll pull the timer right into the center so it's directly below the camera in that open space on my screen. There are other techniques that people are using. They'll take the camera and move it to a different location. I know people that have uh, little arms that they put out that hang just on either side of the camera and put alligator clips on those and then clip their notes to them, especially if you've got like, you know, a flexible arms on, I know some craft. Uh, I've seen those craft lights that have got a little flexible arm with a clip on the end of those. Those things work really good for notes as well. Okay, great. So a couple of people are asking how to get your slides. Would that, would that be just to email you? How to get my slides. Well, I've kind of gone back and forth on this one because I keep changing the presentation and presenting it at various locations. Probably the best thing to do would be to email it because the set that I use today, I made some last minute changes. So I haven't made a shareable copy of it yet. Okay. So I can. Or perhaps uh, it might be easier to look at the re seek the recording. The actual recording. Yeah. 
yeah, in two weeks, this will be up on the district YouTube site and you can by all means check the recording there. Every time I do it, I change it. So that'll be an artifact of this particular presentation.